Today we're going to be talking about organic developer communities and how they've sort of evolved within the blockchain and crypto space. Uh, for me, this is actually a really interesting topic because, you know, uh, a lot of these projects are operating in an open source um, atmosphere, and so trying to understand how we can incentivize developers to actually build on these platforms and in these ecosystems is, again, in my personal opinion, really interesting. So. Without further ado, um, I'm going to announce our panelists. And as I call your name, please feel free to come up to the stage and take a seat. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Tech Chia from Binance X. So welcome, Tech. Um, next person is Ethan Beard from the Spring team at Ripple. We also have William Norton, who's the co-founder and chief technical liaison for uh, Noya Network. And then last but not least, we have Daiki Lee from, uh, who is the Launchpad Manager for ICX Station with ICON. So let's give our panelists a round of applause. Awesome. Okay, so with that, I think we can start off with some introductions. So maybe I can go first. We can work our way down the line here. So my name is Anthony DiPrinzio, and I am currently the head of the BASF Blockchain Lab. If you're not familiar with BASF, we are a very old, traditional German chemical company. So um, working there has been quite interesting, especially since I originally came from the startup world. Um, I actually was an intern with the Spring team two summers ago, so great to be here with you again, Ethan. Um, but yeah, my job is basically trying to figure out how we can leverage blockchain within the company to improve uh, certain processes across our various different business units. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll turn it over to Daiki. Hey guys, uh, my name is Daiki. I'm from Icon Foundation. Uh, within Icon Foundation, um, uh, we founded this thing called i6 Station, which is acting as an accelerator for Icon ecosystem. And then we've recently broadened our scope to uh, incubate some of the projects ourselves internally, but also try to educate developers and uh, spread the developers across uh, the world. And before that, I used to work at a VC fund um, for a few years. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Norton, and um, I think most people know me from my previous career as a co-founder and chief technical liaison for Equinix, in which my role was to spend 90% of my time on the road at conferences like this, uh, internet operations conferences, to try and identify what are the driving motivations in our community and how can we facilitate pulling them together. Equinix, as you probably know, is a very large global data center company, but specifically focused on the co-location. That means that two entities being in that same building provides a certain benefit to them being in that same building. Specifically, they can interconnect with one another with the cost and the reliability of a simple piece of fiber between the two pieces of networking equipment. So it's from that environment <clears throat> that I learned an awful lot about facilitating community interactions. And I'm really excited to, to share some of the lessons that we learned uh, in the internet, early internet days, because um, as, as I say, uh, history may not rhyme um, so it may not repeat itself, but it definitely does rhyme. So I'll share some of the insights that we learned from building other communities in the uh, early internet days applied to here. But today, I actually do work in the cryptocurrency space for a company called Noya Networks. And Noya is building a better internet by providing an overlay, very thin, lightweight overlay protocol on top of the public internet that allows you to send your traffic either direct across the internet or through an intermediary party. So this is a, a shared infrastructure that all of us can take advantage of. And when you share your bandwidth, you earn crypto coins. And when you use that bandwidth, you spend those crypto coins that you earn. And that's basically what we're trying to build today. Great. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ethan Beard. Uh, I work at Ripple. Uh, at Ripple, we're really focused on uh, what we call the Internet of Value, which is helping money, enabling money to move as easily as data does. I think when we look at the world and we look at how money moves today, uh, it's 
pretty broken. The, the networks are old, they're very siloed, it's all very proprietary. Uh, it actually reminds us a lot of the way the internet looked or the way information looked before the internet, um, kind of in the days of fax machines and, and CDs and uh, sneaker net when you used to have to pick up a floppy drive and walk it across the office. Um, and we know that with the coming of, of the internet, uh, the way in which information uh, moved changed dramatically and the volume of information that moved changed dramatically. And I think when we look at where we are today with, uh, with blockchain, with cryptocurrencies, we're at a similar kind of cusp um, in technological change where you, you now can actually move value very, very easily, like actually move value, not pass around IOUs um, and various credits and debits. And so at Ripple, we're, we have a two-prong approach to this. The, the first is RippleNet, which is enterprise software uh, that allows banks to tap into the power of XRP and of cryptocurrency to move, uh, to move money overseas cross borders. Um, and then there's a team called Spring, which is an initiative we've been at for about a year and a half. This is the team that I lead, and it's really focused on enabling uh, a developer platform. It's an open platform for money that allows developers to tap into the power of XRP to similarly move, move money and move value. Hey guys, uh, my name is Tech, and I'm from an uh, initiative called Binance X within Binance uh, Exchange. Uh, it was formed about four months ago. It's a new initiative targeted uh, or focused on developers and developer communities to help them kind of onboard into the Binance uh, ecosystem. And the Binance ecosystem has grown from like a centralized exchange, which has an API and a bunch of SDKs for, um, for developers to build on. And, and it's ever expanding uh, from just exchange functionality to like futures, margins, lending, and, and whatnot, and, uh, and future products that we'll have, to uh, Trust Wallet, which we acquired last year, to uh, the Binance chain, which is a public chain with native DEX functionality uh, that we launched about six plus months ago. So there's a white surface area where developers can develop on top of. So we're the team that actually interacts with the developer communities to help them uh, learn and then collaborate with each other and then also to grow where we have different programs within Binance to support uh, different projects at different stages. Uh, you know, so we have internally, we have partnerships team, we have M&A uh, strategic investment team, we have a labs team that does uh, direct investments, we have Launchpad, uh, which is a public sell platform for token networks and token projects, and, and various other things. So we're the team that talks to developers and then intro that or, or you know refer them internally to talk to the right people um, and that's where we are we're we're um, you know, at Binance X so yeah that's it thanks awesome so it seems like we have a very diverse group of panelists here and I think it'll be really interesting um, to see what all of your perspectives are on uh, growing organic developer communities. And so with that, the first question I kind of wanted to pose to the panel is, how do you currently view the state of developer communities as we see it today? Um, and more importantly, do you see developer communities or just um, open uh, global communities in general with your projects contributing to the mass adoption of cryptocurrencies in general in this space? Um, so with that, I'll kind of let anybody jump in if they have any comments. I can start. Uh, so I think if you look globally, there are about 23 million developers uh, on the planet. So these are 23 million people who, in essence, would call themselves a developer, who get paid or enjoy writing code. I think when I think about developers, I think we're probably aligned. It's like people who sit down and write code, um, whether for a hobby or for, for a living. Uh, when we, we've done some digging into the crypto space, I know Ethereum just kicked off this effort to, to reach a million Ethereum developers. I think they claim around 200,000. Um, when we've tried to scratch the surface a little bit more, we think there's probably somewhere on the order of single digit thousands, maybe 10 to 15,000 developers in the blockchain space. Um, so I think generally we look at the blockchain space as being like a very small uh, and very young and at the very, very earliest stages. Um, and I, in some ways, when I think about it, there, when, if you try to think about like, what is a developer, who are developers? Uh, most developers, I think you can categorize the developers in a variety of different ways. 
if you actually kind of ask a developer, someone who writes code, uh, there's generally you find there are professional developers, like this is how they categorize themselves. There's professional developers, um, and even within professional developers, um, there's kind of people who really, who are in tech companies who write software for a living, and then there are kind of enterprise professional developers. Uh, the former being the ones who will like hack on code all night long, the latter are the kind of show up at 10 o'clock, write your enterprise software, go home at four o'clock type of developers. Uh, so there's professional developers, and then there's hobbyists, and these are people who just like to play around with computers and, and along those lines. So I think that's how they kind of categorize themselves. That being said, when you actually, uh, if a developer shows up at a website, the first thing they do is click on the programming language that they program in. Um, and so this, it's, it's different, like they kind of self-categorize um, by their job, but they actually really do care about the language um, that they're writing in. So not to get too specific on that, but I think in terms of thinking of developers, it's important to, to think about what it looks for. At Spring, we're trying to actually say, how can you take blockchain and uh, and cryptocurrency and come up with practical applications that speak to the 20 plus million developers everywhere. So we think that's what it's really gonna take to get at scale. And most developers we think are really interested in things like money uh, more than like blockchain. Um, and so trying to think about how do you actually come up with a solution that solves a problem for them. Yeah, I can go next. Um, so I agree with Ethan that it is still very early. Uh, there's not enough developers in this space. Um, just by the fact that we haven't found, uh, you know, a, a use case that actually is taken hold uh, with a mass uh, with the masses. So I think um, part of kind of our mandate at Minus X is to really find that use case, regardless of whether they build it on Binance Chain or not. Uh, we're an exchange that has about 160 tokens listed. Um, so any chain or any token that succeeds uh, with uh, mass adoption would be good for us and for the industry. So we take that perspective. Um, we do have our suite of products and we do have uh, millions of users. So we, we did capture a use case that, you know, has quite a bit of traction and we can give distribution to our developers. Um, so we, we, um, we leverage that to kind of influence developers to build with the mindset of uh, product market fit. So we uh, run a program called the Binance Fellowship Program, Binance X Fellowship Program, where we give out uh, grants to open source developers. There are, there's no strings attached. The only requirement is that whatever you produce uh, has to be open source or openly accessible, including research. Uh, we have about 50 plus um, fellows in the program today, including a lot of uh, folks that are speaking at this conference. And and you know we take a, a kind of two-pronged approach. One is to support talent and you know, seek to find source talent in the space and support them. Uh, we, don't, we don't influence uh, as much as to what they're doing because uh, a lot of times use cases come in the left field, you can't really reason about them, uh, especially with, with consumer stuff. And then the other approach is that we can, you know, some use cases we can reason about, right? So for example, uh, crypto's um, advantage for things like ribbons or banking for the unbanked and things like that. For those use cases we can, that we can reason about, we'll try to uh, you know, get a bunch of people together and try to get them to do something in, in those, use, in those uh, verticals or use cases. And that's what uh, we do to kind of support uh, the um, mission of finding product market fit or general adoption in the crypto space. Um, I guess I think I echo two other people that were just uh, mentioned earlier, but I guess in general, I agree that right now in the blockchain developer space, it's very in early days. Um, it's very small compared to the overall developer communities. I think even as I had Icon really focus on trying to get new developers into um, the blockchain developer ecosystem. And I guess just to share some of the things that we're doing, I guess um, we're trying to work with programs like MLH, which does a lot of hackathons across different universities and high schools to really get people exposed to blockchain and what it can enable. And like the reason behind that is I think a lot of these concepts of digital assets and doing things digitally, I think, is quite native to a lot of the, I would say, younger generations, whether that's millennial or Gen Z. And we actually feel that some of these killer use cases will actually come from these 
digital native people thinking about what will be convenient for them. So a lot of our effort is actually trying to really focus around educating the up and coming next generation of developers and try to give them a taste of what blockchain can be and what they can do with blockchain. And I also agree that like we also need to come up with a killer use case. And then I think by fostering these communities of next up and coming generations, we hope that they can come up with a use case that they can find uh, useful for them and hopefully resonate well with the next generation. Yeah, those are all really great points, and I sort of uh, agree with a lot of what was said. Um, and this sort of leads into my next question, which is like, what are some of the key challenges that you've seen when trying to develop a lot of these organic communities, especially since um, you know a lot of these projects and platforms are o are operating in an open source manner, right? This is sort of a you know open source isn't really a new paradigm, but the way we've seen it kind of evolve in the blockchain space is sort of um, unique in the fact that you have a lot of like cross collaboration and things of this nature and it's definitely a question I've been trying to answer uh, within BISF to figure out like oh how can we contribute to these open source projects and engage with these developers and um, I know some of you were mentioning like like you just said engage trying to engage with this new generation um, getting involved in, like hackathons different events things of this nature it's always interesting to try and see you know how, how can we better engage and so um, my first question would be, how do you engage with like other projects in the space um, when you're trying to build developer communities? Or do you not really engage with other projects in the space to begin with? Do you say, hey, this is our platform and this is why we're better than the competition? Or do you take a more, um, uh, take, a, take a bit of a different approach where it's like, hey, this is our platform, but this is how we're actually working with other players in the space? Um, and that's something I've kind of seen you know, uh, with different projects that I've observed. So I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on that aspect of it, but I think that would be an interesting topic for discussion. Um, I would just chime in with a um, similar point that was made to the previous question. One of the things that Noia Networks does is, is we're reaching out to the universities to provide the software that we're developing, to put it in the hands of, uh, of, of the students, um, in part because the students think Cryptocurrency and blockchain technology is just really, really cool. And to actually participate in a real live version without having to get your wallet out is a great opportunity. Uh, but secondarily, um, the applications that these kids may develop, maybe 99% of them are just to satisfy some curriculum requirement. But there might be that 1% that comes up with something that has never been done before. And that's really, really uh, quite exciting. Um, the other th thing I, I, would, I would share is um, one of the things we learn by building other communities in, in the internet is the most important thing is to identify the motivations. And in a big room like this, there's no chance I could go and introduce myself to every person in this room without it taking like an hour and a lot of conversations. And usually what happens to me, I don't know if this happens to you, but usually at the end of the last person I spoke with that conversation, I forgot what the first couple people actually shared with me. Um, so it's not quite as, as, uh, as, as effective. So I, I think it's one of the critical things that we need to do in this community is find out how can we expose and externalize those motivations that underlie why this company, why this product is in existence, so we can then identify where are those cross patterns that will allow us to work more effectively together. So facilitating those interactions is, I think, going to be a, a, a critical activity for a group like this. Um, bottom line, it sounds funny, but we need a lot more parties. So, I mean, just going off of that, like, are there any specific events or, th or things that you've done where you see more engagement from, like, some of the, the younger generation or these other people that you mentioned? Um, just curious. Um, I, I would just be repeating myself. Okay. I mean, we're definitely engaged with the student communities. Uh, I, I think the, uh, to the point that, that Bill was just making is, like, there's a high level of engagement with blockchain, with cryptocurrency amongst, uh, amongst students. And so, like working with clubs uh, like Blockchain at Berkeley, which is uh, where Anthony, where we first ran into Anthony, um, working on hackathons, working with projects, funding projects, being able to tap into those communities is a really great, a great starting place. Cool. Yeah. So, um, as an exchange, we interact with uh, a lot of projects in this space, and also we have users from across the board, uh, all demographics. Um, so at Binance X, we do have. Um, an evangelist program where we 
largely engage with the university communities, uh, CS programs or CS students who are more technical to kind of help them uh, understand how to build crypto apps or dApps and then in turn they could educate their peers. Uh, that's how we kind of spread the word or spread the knowledge and learnings. Um, I, I think it's a new paradigm to for developers to build a dApp. I mean, things have to be audited, have to be secure, you have to deal with cryptography, and by definition, you have to be open source to engender trust in your apps and things like that, things that are, you know, the previous generation developers wouldn't be familiar with. So I think there's a lot of new things to learn, and the dev tooling is not uh, mature enough to kind of abstract a lot of things away, so you still have to dig into a lot of details. So I, uh, you know, so, there's a lot more to do in order to kind of build that um, developer community or developer interest and uh, the ease of uh, development. So yeah, I think you bring up, sorry, I think you bring up an interesting point, which is what's unique about the blockchain space is that because all these networks are distributed, because they're all open platforms, um, in essence, every single person in blockchain is trying to build a platform. Uh, and it's, I mean, I've worked on platforms for a long time. We can count the number of successful platforms in it that are like currently being used on one hand. And so, you know, you have 160 tokens. That's 160 blockchain projects that think they're going to be a platform that some developer is going to use the token or the API or the smart contract layer, whatever it might be, to build something on. Uh, and it's arguably not really realistic to expect that every single one of these is going to have a like thriving developer community. And so it, it is a different world. I do think that like if someone can figure out how do you pull these together, and maybe it is a Binance where you're like, we have all 60 of them, we talk to them, um, that can wrap them up in some way, what, both from the technical aspect, but also from the community aspect, um, so that it's building on a single platform where these various tokens or functionality are actually just a, a capability inside that platform, which seems like it would be a successful approach. Yeah, so for, you know, we have a Binance chain, which, uh, which is a chain based on, uh, you know, Tendermint consensus and Cosmos SDK, uh, which interoperates with other chain, and we have uh, something called Bep3, which is the atomic swap HTLC kind of bridge to other chains. Our kind of perspective is that our, you know, core proposition is liquidity and native DEX functionality on the chain, and we don't have smart contract uh, functionality on the chain yet, so we do like to interoperate with other chains that have those functionalities, and we'd love to uh, work with other chains to, to enable uh, you know, like consumers who use the app, they don't care what chains are, you know, underneath the, the D app. They just want the value that they get out of the D app. So I think um, it's, it's good to abstract those, those from the consumers. It's also good to kind of collaborate together with other chains to kind of make it easy for the consumers and for developers to kind of build new use cases. I guess going a little bit later deeper into that, I think, I actually, I actually make an argument that. Um, like, if you look at it from more from a digital native perspective of these blockchains, and like these blockchains, a lot of blockchains have come to like a community because they believe, oftentimes believe in different philosophy or ideology. And I think um, I can see how like different blockchains can be considered different platforms, but I think another way to look at it is also almost like a different kind of digital nations where they have their own philosophy, they have on their own rules. And it's very like liquid where if you don't like this philosophy of this specific digital nation, you can fork off the network and then basically build something that has very different philosophy. I mean, that's why, that's why a lot of forks happen with Bitcoin. A lot of forks are happening with all these other even different coins like Ethereum and Zcash and all that because they have different philosophies. So I think another way to look at it is also that, you know, these are also these are like core developers who are actually contributing to the core codes of these four networks, and they actually have a strong belief that certain things should be done that way, and that's why they're doing it. So I think another way to look at it is like kind of like almost like a digital nation kind of a state. Um, yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, especially when you think about how this space kind of evolved from like the cypherpunk movement and and like sort of like um, principles coming from areas like uh, libertarianism and things of this nature. I, I definitely resonate with that. Um, but sort of going off of all of these comments, you know, I think that might apply, like, like that philosophy might apply more to people that are already interested in the blockchain space and like what Ethan mentioned in the beginning where it's like, you know, how many blockchain developers are there out there? And it's a lot smaller than just general developers in the space, so it's like, okay, we can bring in those people by having our different philosophies and, and trying to engage with them in that manner, but how do we actually incentivize the people that maybe haven't 
you know, gone all gung ho with, you know, blockchain is the future and, and all this sort of thing. How do we like incentivize them to participate? Have you, have any of you seen um, some things that work, some things that like didn't work at all um, in terms of incentivizing these developers is, you know, is it money that drives a lot of people or is it more um, of something else like just, um, you know, winning prizes at a hackathon? I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I'm curious to hear what you all think about that. So, I, you know, going back to my earlier kind of segmentation, I think the hobbyist developer, you can probably incentivize through fame a little bit. Like, they just want to be stars in their world. Like, if you're a like, crazy Python developer or you're a crazy Ethereum developer, like, and you do it just for the love of it, uh, making them a hero, making them a star in their world is effective. I do think that's, of the 20 plus million developers, a, a minority. Um, of the rest of the developers in the world, there are, there, the reason that people are writing code is to make money, whether that's being paid or but like their job, they want to get a job where they can get paid to write code, uh, or they want to create a startup, or they want to create a business. Like Ultimately, the reason why people are doing stuff is to earn money. Uh, so I would, might push a little bit and say, like, there's no such thing as organic developer growth. Like, there's no, it, not, it doesn't just like, happen. Like the reason that it happens is because people realize that they can get a job if they learn how to program on that platform or they get paid for doing it or they can start a business. So you can look and say like iOS, yeah, I mean Apple has a like large outreach to developers. They have a gigantic developer conference. Like they do a lot of work to inorganically pull people onto their platform. At the same time, I don't remember the exact numbers, I think they've written over $20 billion in checks from the App Store to developers. So why do you build on iOS? Because you can get paid. And so, and ultimately what that starts to come down to is actually one of the main challenges we have in, in crypto today, which is there's no distribution for anybody to actually deploy to, you know, if you want to build an app, on blockchain, you can't get paid because there's no place for a user to actually discover your app, to discover your service, to pay for your service. Well, we've solved the payment piece, strangely enough, in the blockchain. It's like the one thing we have solved. You can get paid. Um, you know, in many ways, I think Ethereum solved at least a primary use case, which was create a token, get paid. Like raise a shit ton of money in an ICO. Like that's, you, you get a lot of developers when all you have to do is just write a little bit of code and you can get like 10 or 20 million bucks and it worked. Tons of developers poured onto Ethereum. Amazing use case for developers to get paid. Just create an ERC-20, and it's like magic. Um, and back in the old days of the, like, early days of the App Store, it was like, just put a game on the App Store, and you're going to get paid. Like, it worked. And then it didn't work, and you had to actually figure out real business models. But, like, Android and, and iOS can bring you a billion users, just put it into their App Store. And there's no place in the crypto space where that can happen. Right? Build on the web, and Google brings you traffic. Build a social app, and Facebook brings you traffic. You know, build an iOS app and Apple brings you traffic. Build a D app and you're, if you're not doing an ICO, you're kind of out of luck. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think money is a great motivator and money kind of sing signifies success and impact, right? You need users to pay you or, or enough, deliver enough value for money to come back to you, so for somebody to pay you. I think that's definitely lacking in a, in a crypto space and uh, the ICO boom, I think, uh, yes, it, it, well, from another perspective is that, you know, crypto reinvented um, funding or crowdfunding, if you will. So you no longer have to, the innovation there, if you're positive or you're taking an optimistic view is that you don't have to go to Sand Hill Road and pitch like 50 VCs who curate the world's uh, startup capital. You can just go to the world and, um, and, and, you know, raise money from anyone in the world. But that definitely comes with negative, uh, you know, consequences as well because there will be scams and people, uh, you know, there will be people who are not earnestly trying to raise money for something they're trying to really deliver. So um, I agree. I think part of the problem is um, the motivation is lacking, uh, where the and that's the direct result of, of the lack of product market fit, the lack of users, and lack of monetization because of the lack of users. So we have to solve that as a, as an industry. I, th I think I do agree that I think money is like probably one of the basic pool for developers. Um, but I think at certain point, I think I think money start do start to matter less less to people. So I think it's kind of a diminishing return when I don't know, and th that threshold may be different from 
for everyone, for all the developers. But I think, you know, for a developer that's working at Facebook or Google that's like making a comfortable living, you know, like when they jump into the blockchain space, um, they're not actually jumping into the space thinking that they would actually make more money than they were making at Facebook, Google. I mean, they obviously need to make a certain threshold of living where it doesn't impact their basic life. But I think at that point, a lot of that, I think, does um, involve like this, this intellectual curiosity of what this new technology can potentially become. And you know, that may, they may potentially have lead to a successful venture or whatnot to get them more money as well. But if, if, if you talk to a lot of these entrepreneurs, like, I think, and maybe it's kind of, I'm maybe a little biased because I've been just in the valley for a little bit too long, but a lot of them actually want to like change things, I think. And that, I think, does seem to be a driver for a lot of people as well after, I guess, they meet at least certain requirement of that money threshold, I would say. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, although I think I agree with what Tech said, which is like money tends to be a measure of impact in many ways. And I think what's attracting like, people to build in blockchain is you're like, wow, this technology can be super, super impactful. But like ultimately it will be measured by lots of but demonstration of success in that space. I think like, it can attract a certain number of people by like, yes, this can change the world. Uh, but if you can't, if no one's making money, it's obviously not changing the world. Great. Um, yeah, just continuing on the topic of like challenges in the space, and this is something that I've always encountered, is how do you make communication um, more efficient, especially when you're growing these communities globally and you know a lot of these developers are distributed? Sometimes it can be really hard to put a face to like a community, um, especially if you have uh, a company you know that's sort of backing. Um, you know what you what's being built and, and kind of what's what's going on. So, I know Bill, you have some experience with this. Um, I was curious, you, what's your perspective on that, um, especially when you have these distributed communities, or like even if you can bring people together in the room, like if there's anything that you think could like really help to facilitate communication, and make it better. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of getting people in the same room at the same time and having. Um, all of those obstacles between two human beings removed, uh, those obstacles being the things that are uh, in between us and clear understanding on the person that's receiving the message that we're talking to. Um, there are all kinds of uh, miscues that happen um, electronically. You probably can cite a few yourself. Um, so, so one of the things that, that we did in the early days, again reflecting back to the, the, the precursor to uh, the, the cryptocurrency and blockchain uh, world stuff is uh, we, we would put together forums to pull people physically together. Now, granted, everyone's busy. You can't actually get there physically. But if you can, again, identify the motivations behind the people that are in th that room and come up with ways to facilitate their interaction, they will walk away from that meeting feeling like it was worthwhile. Like, at this conference, did you make the contacts that you wanted to make? Was there anything that the organizers of this conference could have done to help you meet people that would be beneficial to you being here? And some of the tricks that we used to use, uh, I, I chaired a, a bunch of birds of a feather sessions at Nanog, and I also uh, chaired Nanog for uh, the, the first bunch of years. Um, and some of the, the techniques that we described were actually very manual, and you'd probably think them super duper old fashioned, but um, we would find out in advance, uh, I'm glad to see you're coming into this room, uh, what would you like to get out of this interaction? And we tried doing that publicly. A lot of people don't like being put on the spot. But then doing it in advance of us getting together so we can identify what are the top issues that people are facing. Um, and I'll give you just one, one quick example. Back in the day, during the commercialization of the internet, all the cable companies uh, used a, an upstream internet service provider called At Home. Well, At Home ultimately went bankrupt, leaving the cable companies to find out how to become internet service providers in 90 days' time and buy internet access from the big major tier one ISPs like AT&T and MCI and, and, and so forth. Uh, what they were finding, though, is all this traffic that they were sending was ultimately going to the other cable companies. Why? Peer to peer. BitTorrent and Napster were taking up all the bandwidth. As soon as these guys would put up another big pipe up to their upstream ISP, that would fill up right away. All that latent 
uh, demand, and, and you know, Napster and BitTorrent were pretty relentless about using that capacity. So what would it do? We make that a key topic of discussion. We identify the key people that could stand up here and, and sh share their insights and what they're seeing, and sure enough, you find the community ad adjusted and adapted, and they ended up interconnecting their networks together, bypassing ATN and these other entities. So I, I think that's really one of the key tricks. Back to the first thing I said, you need to identify the motivations and have the people who pull together these organizations into the same room facilitate to maximize the value that they derive from participation. So I, I, I don't know exactly how you do that in the distributed world. I'm sure you guys have some experience with that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, a couple of thoughts. Communication with developers is always uh, challenging and always evolving. Um, I'd say two things. One, developers have a super high bullshit meter. And so it's actually really hard to like sell to developers. Like they actually just have like radar for like, I'm being sold to, get that away from me. Um, and so, you know, if you're gonna talk to developers, the first thing that you want to have is make sure that the person talking to them is a developer. Whether, whatever the form of communication, you need to actually have like a technical person who's actually doing the engagement. Um, otherwise, like very quickly, it's like, oh, you're just trying to sell me on something. I don't want to talk with you. Um, so I think that's important. And then I think one other thing that's quite important is, in essence, to meet developers where they are. Uh, I, this probably works. It's not probably not just developers, but um, you know, there's a reason. Like we're we're sitting in a blockchain conference, which I love, but at the same time, it's like everyone in here is part of this tiny number that we discussed. So how do we actually find developers who are just like the other 20 million of them that are out there? A couple of examples that I've heard recently that are just pretty interesting, which is like, you know, Reddit, there's a lot of developers on Reddit. Like Reddit's a pretty crazy place, and I think as a like business, you might be like, do I really want to try to go like dig into Reddit? It's a great place to find developers. Like they're very, very active. It's not just the basement of the internet. It's like the developers are hanging out there. Another one that actually someone uh, keyed me into that I thought was interesting, which would, you would have never thought to, which is many developers are drawn into technology and programming through video games. In fact, I think you could probably poll this room and like most every, like, every developer started off playing games as a kid and was like, this is awesome. Uh, you can find those people on Twitch. Like developers are on Twitch. Tons of developers are on Twitch. And if they're not, the future developers are definitely on Twitch. And so just thinking about various like, d different places, like where are the developers, I, instead of only trying to say, like, how do I get them into my, you know, into my conference room, but where are they hanging out, whether that's in person or online, and actually reaching out to them with a genuine message? Great, yeah, I definitely um, resonate with a lot of, of what everybody sort of mentioned here. Um, so with the time we have left, I wanted to kind of transition this into like, where do we see the, um, or see developer communities in general moving as we approach 2020? Um, and also I kind of want to pose this question to the panel uh, as well, basically wanting to ask, um, what advice would you give people that are trying to bootstrap a developer community given they don't have some you know, uh, reputable brand that's already established, right? Because when you have a brand that's doing really well and you sort of already have a following, sometimes it can be a bit easier to bring people into the fold. But what would you say to people that don't necessarily have that yet but are looking to start from the ground up and, and build that community? Um, I think, like, building a community, especially I think in the blockchain space, is like kind of very similar to building a company in a way. and. You know, if you're like a CEO that's basically trying to recruit people to your company, I think the first thing you need to do is, you know, we need to figure out what the company's vision is. And um, I think overall, if you look at how a lot of organic, uh, I do think a lot of them are not probably not organic, but at least some not organic developers got involved in these communities are um, through the vision of what these things can do and that basically tinkering their intellectual curiosity. So I think. Um, if you are kind of starting out small and then really trying to build your own community, I think you need to have a clear vision um, that you can sell. And this is basically a requirement for any CEOs as well if you want to recruit any members to your company as well. So I would say like almost like to an extent if you want to acquire a community member that's like treated as almost like, you know, recruiting someone to your a company and you got to be able to sell that vision um, to the community members. And I think that's kind of the basic way to do it. I think there are some other ways to make things better, but I think that's kind of the basics that you need to do, I think, in general. 
Yeah, I think looking at the different uh, communities in, in crypto, um, as, as a new project, I think you really need to hone in on the differentiated uh, features or values that um, that you 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 want to um, you want to have within your your community and versus the other blockchains out there. So if you look at uh, communities like Zcash or uh, Tezos, they have very strong uh, loyal communities, uh, developers and users. Uh, they all have very differentiated um, perspective on what crypto should you know what. Uh, how they should deliver value to to the world, um, so I think it's it's still um, definitely doable to spin a new project and have a very differentiated perspective and have that niche audience and and um, in 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 an age where you connect with anybody in the world through the internet, I think every niche is a huge uh, there's a huge number there in absolute terms, right? So I think it's still possible. You know, it's interesting you compared it to startups. I was going to do the same thing, but not recruiting, um, which I think is, is accurate, but almost thinking it more in terms of uh, a startup and product market fit. And I'm reminded of, uh, of a post by Paul Graham, the, the founder of Y Combinator, where he basically did like, here's how you should run a startup. And it's basically like, find, the, find a few people who love your product and super serve them. Like become best friends with them and just keep delivering more and more features to them and make them love the product even more. And that's the path to actually like finding more people like that. And in many ways, I'd say bootstrapping a developer community is kind of the same. Like if you can find 10 people who love to build on your platform, like put them in a room, feed them food, ask them questions, build exactly what they want, and then just keep doing it again. Like super serve those early users as much as you possibly can. Cause like trying to reach the thousands or millions from the from a starting point of zero is really hard. Great. Um, yeah, and so I guess just going back to that original question uh, that I posed. So, you know, we've kind of discussed where developer communities are at today, sort of some of the challenges that you have all encountered. Um, so what do you see uh, is going to be different, right, as we move into the new year? Like, do you think, um, are, are, are you sort of seeing any trends or anything happening right now um, that will sort of change the way these developer communities um, establish themselves? Or maybe perhaps it's even, um, you've noticed um, there's certain areas where people are more uh, interested in contributing. Do you think that will be more of a focus moving into the future as well? Um, so yeah, if anybody wants to jump in. So I think, um, I agree that there's probably like not like 100% organic developer communities, but I think there's some sort of incentive that need to be baked into kind of pulling in these organic developer communities. And I think it's pretty apparent from existing de big developer communities that Apple has or Android has all these com different communities. So uh, what, I've, what we've been focusing a lot these days at Icon is actually around um, the concept of DAO. I don't know how many people here are familiar with the concept of DAO, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. but the idea is basically to um, enable each individual to uh, maximize their effort for the common goal for the organization, but also compensate it accordingly. And it basically gets rid of that communication issue as well as kind of the typical principal agent problem that uh, arise from the game theory. And I actually think that because uh, blockchain has its assets, and if you think about it, like why does Bitcoin price go up? Because more people believe that Bitcoin price actually has value. So I think it is actually interesting where you can basically have incentives baked into developing this open source community. And some of the things I think we're gonna try, at, at least at Icon, is uh, around this kind of DAO format um, of having each individual developer being one of these DAO members of the system. I mean, one thing that we've noticed, so Spring, uh, the team that I work on at, at Ripple, we started off a little over a year ago, and we actually, it was just a couple of us, so we started off trying to build an ecosystem through like investing and through partnerships. Um, and one of the things that we learned as we met with startups and developers around the world was that it's really hard to build on blockchain. Like Technologically, it is not a simple platform. Um, and so what we've set out to do is, it's, it's actually, I'll take that back, it's actually even hard as a user to like buy and hold any sort of crypto. 
Like, I'm sure everyone in the room has gotten the, like, call from your, like, mom or your aunt or something being like, I just want to buy some Bitcoin. Can you help me do it? And, like, we're getting to the point where at least that's easier. Uh, but for a typical developer to be like, yeah, I want to deploy a smart contract on XYZ platform, it's very, very challenging. And so what we're really focused on at Spring is just, like, how do we make that really simple? Like, how do we just, so we just released a new SDK that cut the lines of code that you need to write to actually, like, move XRP by about 80%. Like, that for a developer is, like, great. It's, like, 80% less problems that I'm going to run into as I'm trying to use this technology. So we're really just working on trying to simplify the process. Yeah, I agree with it, uh, Ethan, here, where uh, the dev tooling part, as you make things easier, you expand the pool of uh, access to, uh, you know, the the developers out there, you expand the pool of developers and they can actually develop apps and the more apps you have, the more chance that you get to, uh, the more probability that there, there's a chance that one of those or a few of those would get massive traction within, within um, you know, the community. So um, I think that's one. And the other one is um, I think developers need to learn how to, um, how to market or how to pitch their app in, ter in terms that normal people would understand. So. Uh, example is in back in the internet days. I think you know. I, I think in today's crypto uh, developer community, people tend to focus on very technical stuff or technical terms to describe things. Uh, you hear things like consensus um, uh, algorithms, you you know, um, hashing algorithms and and um, um, things like that, uh, often mentioned in conferences and stuff. But uh, when you use a product or service, usually the value proposition is really, is it cheaper, is it faster, is it easier, and all that stuff. So those are terms that people would understand. And people, when they use the internet, most people today don't even know how it really works. Nobody understands how TCP IP works. So I think we're still at a stage where those value propositions are not described in terms that people understand. So I think developers need to kind of learn how to market in those terms, yeah. Great, so with that, we have about a little over a minute left. If there's any questions, maybe we can take like one or two. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, one program or initiative that's worked really well in growing developer communities. We have a program called Binance X Fellowship. We have about we have over fifty fellowship projects in the program since early this year. Uh, it's worked really well. It's a small grant, but we have really good talent in the program. You can find the fellows on our website, binancex.dev.dev. So one thing that uh, so in one of my prior lives, I ran the Facebook platform, and so a lot of my kind of developer experience is coming from that. Uh, one thing we did pretty successfully was in essence, packaging up, we used to do these developer garages and they were super unscalable. They were really fun, but we'd like drop a team into like London or Singapore or something. Um, and we, in essence, like packaged that up. We would call it like a dev garage in a box. And we'd like have a bunch of t-shirts. We'd do a bunch of promotion. We'd send some money so that we like bought all the drinks and we would like find leaders within various parts of the world uh, and like, either ask them or they would come to us and have them, in essence, hosting. Like, it wasn't really a hackathon. It was kind of hackathon-esque, um, but it was kind of a, a meetup more than anything else. But, like, making them stars by telling the whole uh, as much of the community as we could about them, giving them money to be able to spend, helping them pay for rent, giving them swag and things like that. And that was, for a period of time, far more scalable um, than us just doing it by hand. There came a point where that didn't scale either. Uh, you start to reach for like 40 or 50 of them a year and you have a lot of people working on it. Cool. That was for developers. Yeah, it was developers on Facebook platform. So I guess for us, um, it was uh, the online hackathon we did about a few months ago. Um, um, was kind of the first hackathon we did to our developer communities and uh, there was a decent prize pool and then a lot of the kind of feedback also going back to the teams that participated in. Um, I think the hackathon, I think, was pretty well received from the community perspective to you know, showcase what they've learned um, throughout the uh, past period of time. Great. Um, yeah, Bill, do you have anything you wanted to leave the audience with before we break up here? Um, no, I, I think these guys said everything I would. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think we're a little over time. So with that, uh, I just want to thank everybody for coming. And if you have any questions, feel free to find us afterward. Thank you.